Hey everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. It is 9.06 a.m. So we're going to get going. All right, thanks everybody. So I now call to order this work session, assembly retreat. It's Friday, September 9, 2022. We are noticed from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. A um, sign has been posted to outside the library and security has been notified to let folks in because this session, as we all know, is open to members of the public. So we'll go ahead and start with assembly member introductions for the record. Randy Salt. Christopher. Christopher. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Oh, Cameron Perez video. Suzanne LaFrance. Austin Quinn Davidson. <laughs> Felix Rivera. Meg Zalatel. Forrest Dunbar. Daniel Bull. Kevin Cross. Pete Peterson. Jamie Hines. Claire, oh. Claire Ross. And I don't believe we have anyone on the phone. Ms. Allard has asked to be excused and Allie Hartman will be joining us again here in a moment. So first off, thanks everybody. Uh, someone suggested we might introduce the member of the public that's here. Yes, indeed. We are joined by a member of the public. Oh, this one. Can you introduce him? He can't really. He's not <laughs> um, we are joined by Wilder Quinn Davidson, who you may be, you may hear him commenting in the background. He's a little unruly. Point of order. Nothing else. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for being here this morning. Appreciate you all making the time to participate in this retreat. I wanna especially thank Claire and Allie for organizing this event and putting everything together and making all the arrangements. This retreat takes a different approach to some of our prior retreats where we have focused more on subject in, individual subject matter experts addressing the body and um, focusing on aspects of the job, whether it's ethics code or dealing with the media. This time we have a more collaborative approach and um, Claire and Allie worked with members and took feedback and the, a lot of the feedback was around having something more interactive. Is that Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks Claire. I appreciate you doing that. Um, some of you also mentioned that you like the process we use for ARPA, and we don't get too many opportunities to openly collaborate, and hopefully this will be an opportunity to do that today. The more we can work together around common goals, the better the outcome for our community. And um, I do first want to acknowledge that we function in an unusual environment. My background um, is in the corporate world, and so many times people say, oh, government should be more like business. Mm -hmm. And obviously we have things that business doesn't have, like the Open Meetings Act. I don't know about the rest of you, but in my day life, if someone has an idea, <laughs> first of all, there's no I in team, mm -hmm. right? And second of all, you socialize it among people so that you're building consensus. But um, in our jobs, consensus isn't required and sometimes it's really inefficient because we only need seven or eight people to move legislation forward. But obviously there are different kinds of values and benefits from consensus. And when we can find those um, common goals and move forward in agreement, I think that there is value to the community when we do that. I also wanted to comment too, just, you know, local government is really close, as we all know, to people's lives and 
the statement about you know, potholes aren't political. And um, I think it's true for me, when I first got on the body, I was amazed at how nothing you know, unites a neighborhood more against local government than like a rezone everyone hates, <laughs> where you, you, know, you see people from all different backgrounds who really, was that me? Oh, not in your district. Uh, they don't do I guess I shouldn't generalize. Um, everyone hates it. Or, or a highway project. Right. Um, and so that really actually helped me to look at the role in terms of solving problems and working with people. And we, we encounter a breadth of issues, you know, from noisy roosters to... Um, noisy cars to, again, you know, rezones and land use and liquor licenses. I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable, all the issues that we engage with. But I believe when we do focus on the issues, we get a lot done. Um, that's one of the reasons, too, like, I really appreciate Robert's rules and how, you know, we don't speak to motive. Because when we do, we're not focusing on the facts and the issues, and it's part of what helps us get things done. Um, I also want to say that given the difficulties, or I shouldn't say difficulties, but the unusual environment and how in some ways it's not conducive to collaboration, it makes me just really appreciate this group and, and how when we look at like our goals and um, our strategic plan, and thank you, Felix, for being so instrumental in moving us forward on that. We do manage to find ways to achieve consensus and collaborate. And, you know, part of that, too, is the willingness of members. I mean, this is kind of like the ultimate peer review, right? You're not just having ideas critiqued by others, but it's publicly and it's recorded. And so you kind of have to have a thick skin. And I think that that, um, that willingness to really dig in and um, scrutinize ideas is to the benefit of the community. And we come up with, with better outcomes as a result. So, you know, thank you all for your work on that. Um, the strong opinions and can be very constructive for debate. And um, then we can also still move on. And even when it gets contentious, there's still that, um, those common goals and, and, and shared values. So there's always some outliers. But I think maybe it was Forrest. You pointed out to me how um, I know when I first got on the body that most, most votes are unanimous. And that's something that a lot of members of the public, I think, don't realize. And that's still true, even now, in an environment that's often referred to as highly polarized. And so I think that shows that as far as like getting the work done and focusing on business, that we're doing that. And so I thank you all for your commitment to getting the work done. As far as the agenda, we're going to be taking a look at the communications plan. And um, I want to thank our legislative services team for all the work that they've been doing in getting communications and information out to members of the community, um, to constituents. And again, we talked about that a little bit yesterday in rules, but that is feedback that um, you know, we often receive is you know, how to get access to information. Can you make it easier for, for people? And, Thank you, Claire and Allie, for doing just that. Also want to note that we'll be taking a look at our goals. Thank you, Felix, for um, taking us through that part of our agenda. And when we develop the 2022 work plan, we set a lot of goals. We have just over a quarter left to finish them. So we, you know, we need to take a look at what we want to finish on, focus on. And if there's some we want to let go or others we want to push through. And then um, to next year. And then finally, we have the panel and collaborative session on housing. And that's 
not something that we've had an opportunity to really discuss as a group. I think this is an excellent opportunity for us to collaborate. I know Felix in the Committee on Housing and Homelessness, um, you've done some initial work on coming up with some, I think, a plan and policy. And so I'm hopeful that we can get to a point where as a body, we have some, have a resolution on some goals and how we want to approach um, the shortage of attainable housing and low housing stock in our community. I mean a document. Yeah, but it would be that like we have handled not necessarily today, but if and that is um, an idea that I'd like members to consider. I mean, we have done that before, where we have um, identified common goals, and while we may not specifically address each one, if we can come up with a shared policy or a policy um, or set of policies that we agree on, um, maybe then too we can break it out. If, just looking at our work list, a lot falls to some of the committees. I mean, CEDC has a really full agenda. I noticed public safety does, and obviously housing and homelessness is quite busy. So, um, <laughs> If you know there might be a way that it once we come up with that we can break it out and get more done because I think that is an area we all agree on it's you know nationwide a major issue and here in our community as well so I will um, stop there because I see we're already three minutes <laughs> over but um, I look forward to digging in with all of you today on these issues and again thank you so much for making the time to be here and um, I just wanted to say as well thank you for letting me serve as chair I appreciate it and it's it's an honor to serve and I just appreciate all that you all do to serve our community so with that I will turn it to Claire and Allie are you Sure, go ahead. Um, okay. Just quickly, since you brought up the Community Economic, Economic Development Committee, um, I was on that for a little while, and to be honest, I was pretty disappointed in the committee because it felt like we mostly just evaluated marijuana and liquor licenses. And there was some talk back when Be Becky Wint was here. I talked with her, and so did John, about, you know, could we make it so that there were kind of like the Board of Equalization, there were another body that evaluated those because really it takes the bulk of our time in that committee. That's not about exciting economic development in our community. It's about approving licenses. So um, anyway, it's been a conversation ongoing, but just for the new members and maybe who, you know, if someone wanted to pick that project up or kind of reinvent that committee, or maybe we need a new committee. Like maybe we need a marijuana and liquor license committee, and then we need an actual economic development committee. Cause I, I don't feel that that's why I left the committee. I just felt like it wasn't very interesting to be honest. Actually, I think Kevin was gonna, okay. Look. Yeah, I, I think that the timing is interesting on that matter because at the time we were at the tail end of the very beginning of the industry and now they just don't come like they did we get a couple a year maybe just a handful yeah and when we streamlined the with my my pete and my project and maybe kevin's project to streamline the licensing requirements to biannual for campus we reduced that load in half again so i think that might be resolved but the question of what's the mandate for that committee is a good one Peter, Kevin, did you want to speak? Oh, okay. Th thanks, Suzanne. Well, um, for you know, the first half a dozen years or so after the new industry started, we were reviewing licenses, new licenses, and uh, now that I would say most of the facilities have been leased, that. Uh, <laughs> that the industry can use, I, I, I expect a, a reduction in the number of new licenses. And so I, I just don't think it's gonna be taking anywhere near as much time of the committee's you know, you know, agenda that, that it, like it used to. So anyway, that, that's, that's my prediction. Thanks, Pete. And by the way, um, 
for those who don't know, Kevin is the vice chair of the CEDC committee. Oh. I may have forgotten. <laughs> Welcome. Yes, so I'm looking for my membership card in the mail. <laughs> um, no, but you make a great point. And so, you know, obviously when the industry is new, that takes up a bulk of your time because, and now we're still kind of ironing that and, and ironing out that process for those businesses. Oh, uh, you know, we're still ironing out those process for those, uh, for those businesses, but I would agree. And I guess the question then comes in, how often do we look at our committees and whether or not we need to start a, another one, or do we just reappropriate what we're doing within and reassign some tasks because they're overlapping? I mean, how often does that happen to sit down and say, you know, are we being effective? Are, is this committee underworked? Can it be reappropriated? Or, you know, or do we just get into the grind of this is my committee, this is what I'm doing, and we don't look at the bigger pictures of it? The most effective use of our time is there ways to consolidate, or do they need to be expanded? You know, and when, when do we have those conversations? So, thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. And, and so, so we're using first names here, please. Are we? Yes, we're using first names. <laughs> Go ahead. Perfect. Okay. So, um, what was I going to say? So, yeah. Since we're talking about CEDC, you know, one of the, and since my name has been brought up several times as it relates to housing as a priority. I just wanted to be like super clear, like the Housing and Homelessness Committee shouldn't be the place where we talk about all of the solutions to housing. In fact, I think the Housing and Homelessness Committee really needs to deal with the permanent supportive housing and affordable housing aspects of housing. I've always thought of CEDC as the committee that should deal with the rest of the housing spectrum and how we can um, sort of clear whatever hurdles there are in developing the rest of that housing spectrum. So that's how I've always considered the work. Sort of, we have our domain, CDC has their domain, we should work collaboratively, obviously, um, because we can't work in silos, but that's how I have considered it. Thanks. So Pete and then Chris. Thanks, Suzanne. And you know, when I was first elected, we didn't have a housing or homelessness committee we, that was created. And the Community and Economic Development Committee was, was called the Title 21 Committee when I was first assigned to it. So we, we have been adjusting as we've been going along. And so maybe we're to the point where we need to, you know, back off and take a look and maybe talk about another adjustment. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Chris? Yeah, so I think this speaks to a broader concern and opportunity, and we don't have it in the agenda today, and so we don't have to take it up today. It could be in the Rules Committee, and it could follow a process where each committee reviews its kind of mandate, what its mission is with its members, kind of outlines what they think is going well, what they think is not, and what could be going on. And then we have a third column of what are issues that are taking up a lot of our time that might need a committee, and then annually, we should do a process to review the work of the committees and refocus them if needed. I think there's that's a process we should engage in. We probably won't solve it today, but it's a good idea. Go ahead, Meg, and then Austin. Yeah, I like Chris's suggestion because I don't think some subjects fall with just in one committee. So housing is a major major determinant of health. So, you know, like, I think there's lots of overlap in ways to get at topics and especially the big topics. Um, so I just want to make sure we, we take the opportunity to look at them from various viewpoints because different stakeholders would like, and experts would likely come to the table um, to talk about how those topics intersect with their work. I was just going to say thanks for the conversation and I must be an old timer now because my information is several years old and outdated. Oh, no. um, but thanks for correcting me and also just for the discussion. These things are so fun because you guys are so smart and engaged and a lot of times in other avenues and other settings we don't get to do this and I, I just love these things because it's actually brainstorming and we're collaborative and so thanks. Yeah, one last note. Um, just on that topic of the third category, things that we don't have a committee process for but really need attention, Parks and Rec, we don't have any committee work that addresses the work of our Parks and Rec department. It looks closely at its mission and how it's functioning and where it's going. 
And our Parks and Rec Department effectively has become a homeless response department and it's no longer investing in parks as community spaces. Mm -hmm. And so it's important, I think, that in transportation issues, AMATS is a separate body and it tends to be the only body that talks about transportation, but transportation impacts all of us. And so I could think of a number of areas that we need to find a way to loop into a process because we don't get briefings unless we ask for them. And if we don't have a process for that, and often we don't get them then either, but that's a different story. Um, we need to set up a process where the biggest issues we face can flow into our workflow. Thanks, Chris. Um, I always assumed that Parks and Rec was under CEDC, actually, but um, the community part of the C. But that's a good point. And then um, the transportation issue, I know we've it's been a while since we've talked about handling that like in a separate way. I guess for now, too, we could, as you suggested, address um, some of these issues in the rules committee as a start. Um, I know some people have expressed having meeting fatigue and um, just want to be sensitive of that. Cameron? Uh, oops. OK. Hi. Um, yeah, I guess I would suggest that we, we do think about meeting to talk about meetings, uh, meeting <laughs> to, uh, to talk about uh, the committees in general, because uh, I like this discussion also, and I also want to talk a little bit about just what the function of the assembly committee is um, in general, because we're going through this process right now of trying to develop this sort of different kind of committee, this, this um, advisory equity committee, and we're learning a lot about what we what we can do and what we can't do and how it's supposed to work and uh, etc. And it's always been a, a challenge for me to really understand what the function of the, these committees are and whether they're about sharing information in a different setting, with, whether they're about um, developing potential um, um, ordinances and resolutions. What what, what are they for? And, and, um, and I think they don't all have to be about the same thing, but I do think it'd be healthy to have a discussion about what the function of, of them are. And I think we're in a different different environment right now with the, this administration than we were in the previous administration. And so they have changed per purpose in, in some ways. And so um, I would just encourage us to have that meeting and to, and to be really explicit about what we feel like the functions and the purpose of those committees are um, and, and make sure that we're... Um, expressing that publicly as well so that the, the, the public knows why we have them and what they're for. Thanks. Thanks, Cameron. Pete? Thanks, Suzanne. And, you know, I just was reminded that when I was in the legislature, uh, there was just talk from leadership about creating a committee on committees. <laughs> and the press had a field day with that. And so uh, I, I would just recommend that we not create a committee on committees. Thank you. A task force? <laughs> Chris and I then Meg. This will be it. But um, I agree. I have noted on my paper here, Committee on Committees, the legislature does that. But our rules committee effectively can work that way. And I think that much like Mr. Dunbar's principle of a time schedule is a ceiling, not a target, one of our goals should not be to create more committees, but to figure out which committees broadly address the concerns, and then if there's time and bandwidth for that committee, take it on. And then if there's not, then we could do special committees and ad hoc committees and other work that needs to be done. But it's the goal, I think, isn't to expand our array of meetings that we need to have. It's to make sure we're using the time that we need most effectively to meet the mission of our targets. So I think I had Meg and then Randy. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I will always find time for a committee to meet about transportation. I get excited about transportation. I might be, well, I know there's a few of you other ones out there too. So, um, but I think that the reason I mentioned that is, I think as part of this examination, and when I had the opportunity to talk to Spinard Community Council the other night, um, there are six representatives that ultimately go to that meeting over time. As I talk to them about what I'm excited about and what I concentrate on, um, because I don't want, I can't become an expert in everything that the municipality does. Um, and so some of that's relying on committees. Also, some of that's relying on some of you all to be experts in these areas. Um, so that's how I view part of this as well is 
I don't want to be on every committee and I don't want to be a part of every discussion because I know what really fires me up and what I'm really interested in. And I hope that we have that kind of um, symbiotic relationship where we kind of rely on each other to divide up the work. Thanks. Thanks, Meg. Randy? So I guess just building on what Cameron said, you know, I'd suggest each committee really goes back and reviews their charter and make sure it's clear what they do. And then as a whole, we make sure there's no gaps that everything's covered. But also, <clears throat> it helped us, and again, sort of semi still being new, um, a, a lot of the meetings don't start off with what we do while we're here. So it might really help the public if you start off a committee meeting saying, hey, here's what this committee is about. And it'll help get the audience in place. If they want to talk about something else, that's not part of this committee. And, and help, I guess, shorten the meetings and make them a little more, more crisp. Thanks, Randy. Felix? Thanks. So I just have a sort of logistical question because I see a lot of people taking notes. So is that sort of uh, what we're, are, are people taking notes so that we can keep track of these ideas and then see possible implementation? Mm -hmm. OK, great. Because what, what I don't like having is retreats where we talk about a lot of things and then nothing happens. And so we're here a year later. Thanks. Maybe talk about else. Yeah, we can definitely, I, I think, follow up and have some after conversations and rules. And I know Claire and Allie are documenting, I'm documenting, and we'll take some of it and see where it fits on rules and keep it under unfinished business, Chris. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to um, note too that we, it, it, it does seem like a, a good time to revisit committees. I know we've done that Regularly, in fact, the agendas for committees have changed, like they include legislative priorities. I think some have the mission statement, which is on the web page, mm -hmm. budget priorities, but it's a good question. I mean, do we want to use the committees more to enact the goals of our strategic plan? Um, I'm not sure we've completely necessarily approached it with that kind of overlay. It's something to consider. Okay, so I think now we can move one of these days Allie you will get to tell us about the communication <laughs> plan. Oh Wi-Fi oh, yeah. Wi -Fi. Um, <laughs> the mini, yeah the mini Wi-Fi. Like <laughs> no the mics are plugged in. Yeah, yeah there's filtered and unfiltered. <laughs> it's the good stuff. It's the good stuff. Why? There, because children use the internet here, they have to have a filtered one for youth use. So some people think maybe that one's the better one to get on because less people are on it. It's higher speed, but they're both really high speed. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, this this guy, I love I love it when we're all together like this. Y'all are so fun. Okay, so back to the communications plan. I was just gonna follow up on that last discussion on rule on committees. I took a lot of notes, and I think this is something that I could work on in the interim, and maybe talk to somebody to get your ideas, and then. Um, have a presentation or some kind of format developed for a future rules meeting. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna hand over all of my time to Allie to present on the communications plan, and, um, and then Dean will go after that. And then, um, Jamie, if you have a few words you wanna say about elections, if there's anything you wanna share, you're welcome to as well. All right, I'll hand it over to Allie. Sweet, today's the day, woohoo! Um, I gotta say, I am so jazzed to be in this room and hearing these conversations as um, somebody who considers themselves um, a communications nerd, um, but certainly just a geek for local government and public administration. Um, what a dream come true to be like sitting here and listening to these conversations. So, um, you know, I bring a lot of passion and enthusiasm to my work. And after the rules committee meeting yesterday, I was thinking a little bit about um, how, you know, um, 
just wild it is that I could be considered a, a professional in this work. Um, and in, in that role, um, I want to just be totally transparent with you. I am here for your thoughts, for your feedback, for your criticism. I want this product and what the assembly produces to be as high quality as possible. And I think that that happens by, um, as Suzanne was saying earlier, right, a level of scrutiny and, and a level of, um, you know, really critically looking at what we're producing um, on your behalf and making sure that it reflects the values, the work that you all do. So um, thinking a little bit about the conversation that you all just had, one of the things that I'm really excited about with this plan is that it really tries to amplify the key messages around the priorities and work that you're doing that you all set where there's intersectionality between committees and between um, areas of expertise. I really want to amplify your voices and help the community know that they um, can trust the people in the room to understand what their problems are, to solicit feedback, and to be a part of the conversation. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So this communications plan um, is um, something that I'm... Uh, really proud of, but it's also definitely a work in progress. Um, and so throughout this conversation, and when you get the chance to um, review the like paper draft form, um, you know, my uh, ears are absolutely open to you. And I welcome your feedback, just honestly. So um, I sent out a paper copy. It's got a draft watermark on it. It's a work in progress. Um, and if you didn't get the chance to talk through that, um, you know, after rules yesterday, I've even started to kind of come up with some ideas about what I could foresee changing or tweaking to better reflect um, kind of your goals moving forward. Um, so today, this is a quick little overview of that plan with the intent of um, kind of, you know, describing some of the strategy and the um, philosophy behind doing um, this type of planning over the course of 2023. Um, so I want to start by recognizing what the goals of the plan are. And these goals are kind of a means to an end to really strengthen public trust in local government and the assembly um, and to move toward what I consider to be a, a fundamental pillar of local government, which is engaging the people in visioning the future of their city. So when I talk about lowering barriers to increase public access, it's with the core belief that the public should have access to be engaged in the process, right? Um, I want to amplify key messaging that includes your priorities, your goals, um, these key topic areas, and make sure that people know that those are things that you're working on and then increase the reach of assembly business. Um, and as we talk a little bit about audiences here shortly, you'll see what I mean. I see audiences, I think lots of communications professionals try to dissect audiences by like demographic or, or different groups of people. But I think looking more broadly at Anchorage, we um, live in a really diverse community and it's not fair, I think, to put people in buckets around their um, identity without recognizing kind of where they're coming from or, or where they're at in life. <clears throat> so um, I see kind of three tiers and I love a three bucket system. So you'll see a lot of three buckets <laughs> throughout this presentation. Um, thinking about the people that you talk to every day, the folks that are, um, you know, just generally engaged. I think about media organizations, um, activist groups that are just very tightly tied <laughs> to the work that you do, people that you hear from pretty often. Those folks are engaged. They understand kind of what's going on. They know how to navigate the website or what to look for. Um, and so that's a, you know, a, a tier of people um, that exist and, and should be a part of this conversation. Then I see some more like issue driven groups, right? And so those um, people maybe are involved in community councils that have um, concerns about the skate park in, you know, their district, right? Or um, you have uh, like hyper specific issue based concerns. This could also include like industry experts and making sure that um, leaders in different fields are involved in the conversation. And then there's this kind of more passive group. And you might even consider this group entirely disconnected. And these are residents that just go about their lives day to day, just enjoy their lives in Anchorage, 
have some thoughts, maybe some like random things that sometimes pop up in their life, but otherwise are not very familiar with the public process or with maybe even what the assembly is. And so across those three tiers, I see there being a really great opportunity to empower some fluidity, right? Make sure that people who are um, passive members of this audience, um, if an issue comes up, they know where to find information and they know where to connect with you. Those that are maybe more issue driven, um, for them to take a step back, right, and feel comfortable tuning out of some conversations so that they can jump back in and they know that they um, have the resources and the ability to do that. So really wanting to find some fluidity um, and maybe even looking at the engaged group, right? Um, some folks that are just like hyper-focused. If we're increasing public trust, um, you know, maybe then they too will have the opportunity to kind of step into more issue-based um, advocacy and, and community engagement. So um, a lot of this work is about empowering the public with the tools to kind of move through these tiers and engage with you on issues that are a priority to them so that you can balance your priorities too, right? And, and not have to listen to everything all the time, forever. So um, there are a number of methods identified. We've got some existing methods. The website, the newsletter is brand new this year. Um, earned media, we do press releases and op-eds. Um, and so those are, are really great things, but we can expand those, right? And we can um, improve the website like we saw yesterday. Um, one of the things that um, came out of conversations like one-on-one -on -one with um, a number of you was the desire to have more like personalized conversations and reports to your district members. So in 2023, I'm really excited to um, implement a new tool in the newsletter to have district based reports where depending on where somebody um, lives, they can indicate what district they live in and receive a newsletter that has a personalized report from you all speaking to your district. Uh, yeah. Meg actually has a question, comment. Yeah. <clears throat> Make sure we include in existing methods, like a conversation with constituents. I mean, this totally very um, external versus internal communications. But I mean, the best methods I have communicating with my constituents are like talking with them and walking with them often. So. Mm -hmm. And community councils, yeah, Google and Austin. Um, but we do, we're, and we're back into some of that face to face communication, which yeah. I'm hoping is the great reset. Thanks, Meg. That's a great point. And I want to note, Emily, that some of us have had like constituent coffees and mm. town halls and targeted community meetings, too. Yeah, that's great. You know, that'd be good is for us to like, like I use Microsoft Notes for my community council reports. Is maybe if we all, we all probably do something like that, they share that with her and say, hey, this is what I'm using. Mm. What I use on a daily basis. You may see, hey, I can combine this and make it easier for everybody. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, kind of um, pulling together talking points around, um, you know, specific issues or um, things that are going on is something that Claire and I have been working on over the last um, couple of months. Um, but even getting into the habit of sharing notes like that will really help us um, with some of the other ideas that have come up, like just at Rules yesterday, talking about having member or maybe a district page on the website um, where we can post reports. And as long as you're writing notes for community council reports to pull those in, that's, that's um, low hanging fruit in my mind. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you'll see that um, uh, definitely the kind of focus of the communications plan I'm now realizing are like material things, um, but then thinking about what kind of resources legislative services can offer you all um, to empower those one-on-one -on -one conversations, the, um, you know, the, the way that you engage with community councils and answer their questions um, is really great feedback. Thanks for that. Um, and so, you know, in addition to expanding um, some existing methodology for distributing communications and amplifying your messaging, um, would love to incorporate and strategize around how we would implement some social media presence. Um, and, you know, I think uh, 
the conversation that we had yesterday was so um, enlightening and really, really helpful and kind of wrapping my mind around um, in some ways why I am presenting the ideas that I'm presenting. Because I think that um, there is an element of social media that is, um, you know, just throwing ideas out into the ether, into the world and letting them be consumed, right? Um, and so I think that if there's a clear strategy or a clear objective behind um, what content is being put out there um, to the point of having a really high standard. Um, that consistency is something that, um, you know, I think people that use social media really appreciate. It performs well across various platforms, depending on the platform. And so today we'll talk a little bit about those ideas. Overall, you know, throughout the website, throughout the newsletter, throughout um, you know, things like social media, um, but then also thinking about the materials that you use, um, you know, giving presentations, etc. cetera. Um, I think branding is a really great opportunity for the assembly um, to have some consistent materials um, and consistent um, templates that you all can use. So a piece of this puzzle is um, something that we're calling the style guide, um, and that is about typography, about graphic design, about that kind of stuff, so that we can um, maintain a uh, consistent look and feel. And um, these are some of the values that I derive from uh, conversations with you all about maybe what that personality of the assembly as a whole might look like. So one of the things that um, I think is a great opportunity for us is using place-based um, images, references, etc., in assemblies, um, you know, look and feel. So when I talk about having like a, a district specific section of the newsletter to use photos from your district, right? So that people identify with that area. Um, in the website update, um, to be using pictures from across all the districts so that every district has representation throughout the website is really important. I also see a, a great opportunity in Kind of our physical environment, recognizing um, seasons as a universal experience. No matter who you are, wherever you live in Anchorage, you are experiencing the seasons. And so um, to reflect seasonality in the communications work is easy. It's um, maybe more subliminal um, than a lot of the other more overt messaging um, that we'll do throughout our communications. Um, but I think it adds a, a really polished touch and indicates to people that we're all in this community together um, and has a really unifying, um, you know, kind of factor to it. And then um, to be connected, right? To um, have action oriented and intuitive navigation is something that I'm prioritizing across the website. Um, communications should really speak to people and, and be um, meet them where they're at. Um, so that means maybe sometimes backing off of some of the jargon, helping to explain what an AR is because plenty of people don't know, right? And, and we'll need to understand what the purpose of a committee is, right? Why, why is this group coming together in the first place? Um, and so that's something that is incorporated um, into this brand. So this is maybe how some of that look and feel plays out um, in social media. Um, here I've totally mocked up, this is totally fake, a Twitter account for the Anchorage Assembly. And you'll see that um, on the left-hand side, um, there's a summertime image um, of Westchester Lagoon, um, and that could change into autumn, into winter, and into spring. Um, Twitter, I think, is an exciting opportunity for the Assembly to um, pilot a social media presence um, because it's super easy to automate a Twitter feed. And in this case, um, there, it would be pretty um, simple and, and I think an interesting just pilot project um, to automate meeting information. So when a new meeting is added to the agenda um, or to the, to the calendar, um, to tweet that that meeting is happening. Um, and we've actually gotten comments um, through legislative services from media organizations, from constituents, like how can I know when there's a meeting added to the calendar, do I have to check every single day <laughs> what the assembly calendar looks like? Um, and so to put that information where people are, which is on their phones a lot of the time, um, it, I think is um, an easy way to um, start dipping toes into the social media world and seeing what the, the reception is. 
Yeah, Meg. So who uses Twitter in Anchorage? Like, I don't have any clue. Like, what, like, what's the... Major community of the Yeah. Like, what's what's the the group? Like, because you identify those groups. Yeah. The passive is this general residents or are these like super engaged people already? So I don't have a good sense of what. (laughs) Yeah. Um, That's a really great question. Yeah, totally. Um, And there's an element of the um, written communications plan that outlines kind of demographically um, maybe what types of residents may be using certain platforms. Um, So there's a a written element to that. Um, You know, I uh, noticed around the table people saying engaged um, members of the community, and that's certainly true. Um, There are uh, groups of people that are very tuned in. And in some ways are already doing this. So you might see like community groups that post, hey, tomorrow there's gonna be this meeting or whatever. Um, And if you want to call in, you know, this is the number. Um, So in some ways that's providing them a resource where they have reliable information from our information and from our calendars. And there's maybe a a bit of a streamlined um, access to meetings and and, um, assembly business. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of people on Twitter who are not engaged in assembly um, work, right? Um, And uh, using Twitter consistently um, helps amplify um, what you're doing in the algorithm. And um, as that, as something like this is um, used and, and is a resource that is available, if something were to come up and there's a meeting information um, available on Twitter, um, you know, I, I think that you're preparing for an opportunity um, to be able to respond to something that is like a current issue or a hot topic or something that, that bubbles up. So being physically, not physically, being present on the platform gives you the opportunity to respond um, and maybe reach people that aren't otherwise engaged. So Ali, I saw Forrest from London in the queue. No? Oh, okay. Well, I know, so I know we all tend to confuse the two of us. No! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so no, I think that's good. I mean, I'm I'm kind of like Meg. I don't do social media. Yeah. At least I don't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but to me, what would also be really helpful is spoon feeding people how to self help themselves. I mean, it's mm-hmm. amazing the number of calls, and I imagine we're all saying potholes, code enforcement, mm-hmm. noise. And to me, it's pretty straightforward on the Muni website, how to get there, how to get the Anchorage Works. Mm-hmm. But for a lot of people, it's, they still struggle with that. So whatever platforms we use, it'd be nice to have that big red help button, like click here, and then very clearly, what, whatever the top 10 common issues we are, yeah. we all have. It's like, here it is. You know, I've even started putting my, anyone sends an email to me, they get an auto reply, and that's in there. It's like, hey, if you've got this here, hit these buttons, hit the spoon feed. Try to, try to keep the monkey on their back. So, so then Felix and then Kevin. Thanks. Uh, okay, yeah. So thanks for that, Randy. I was gonna I was gonna bring that up. I, you know, I think it'd be interesting to just have something sort of uniform that any assembly member wanted to just ban because I know that would probably solve like almost half of the constituency. <laughs> <laughs> um, although a lot of my constituents like the personal touch so um, but uh, the other thing which I know something Chris has talked about a lot is um, you know this this is an interesting sort of uh, passive way of, of getting events to community members but um, I think a, a more active way which even just this week uh, a constituent of mine wanted to know about the public safety committee and mm-hmm how could they get notification about the Public Safety Committee? And I said, well, you gotta go to the website. There's not really a place where you can say, send me an email or send me a notice about when this meeting is happening. So, and I know that's something that Chris has talked a lot yeah. about. And I don't know if, like, where, where that is, if it's stuck in IT world, which tends to be the color of dreams. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, right. uh, and the, the third, third thing, uh, 
uh, sort of unrelated that I wanted to bring up, although interestingly related. Um, so at 10.15, I'm going to be stepping out to do an interview with Lauren Maxwell. Um, and do you, is there sort of uh, any opposition of me sort of mentioning this? And hey, if you want to come in, the, the body's doing this retreat thing here. Because I know sometimes when the media is here, it changes the tenor and tone. She's coming here. Yeah, I'm doing an interview with her at the Liz Act. Well, no, I'm, I'm doing an interview with her on a separate topic. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to see if there's any Like B roll or something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no one cares. Yeah. I'll let her know. Hey, you can come in. We're doing this thing. Okay, great. So, Kevin, <coughs> then Chris, then Cameron. All right, so. I appreciate this. Uh, I'm not a Twitter. I'm, <laughs> and, in fact, I'm not a Microsoft uh, guy. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm not going to speak about anybody, but in particular, but you know, not everybody's super tech savvy around here. Okay? <laughs> I'm not going to name drop or ruin anybody, but some people still use Brewery Finders. Um, but our greatest strengths are often our greatest weaknesses, and on the Muni website, it will tell you the greatest strength is you can find, if you know, if you are persistent enough to find everything. everything. Yeah, totally. But it is 10 pounds of crap in a five pound bag. Mm -hmm. Meaning that it is a lot to go through and hard to find. So as far as communication is part of what you have and what Randy's speaking about, I have people calling me about stuff all the time like, oh, that's fantastic. I've seen it there somewhere. Mm. Yeah. Give me an hour to start thinking into it, see if I can find where it is, and then I'll send an email three days later like, oh, it is the 87th link on the bottom of the third page down here, that's mm -hmm. where you find the information. So yeah. perhaps part of that communication is how do we reorganize our municipal website mm -hmm. so that it is scratch and sniff simple for those cave people out there who still use 3D binders. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. I have um, some thoughts on that that we'll get to here shortly. Chris? Yeah, thanks. And I think the new design, even though it's challenging to get new, is always challenging. It does lay out, I think, the most used functions very cleanly and efficiently. So some of that has been sorted to the side. And I last week, maybe two weeks ago, there was a test email sent out with a mm. uh, newsletter. And um, actually, when that came out, I thought, oh my God, we're getting closer. Because if you actually look at that email, it has the fundamental framing for how we might do a subscription system to the content streams that are, are available, like every time we update a committee page kind of a thing. And so I think the next step on that project, if you aren't already working on it, is to start subdividing the content areas that we do the most work in and think it through. So I actually was inspired when that accidental or test email came out because I could see that's the work towards the goal of making it easy to subscribe to content areas. You've got about five more minutes. Okay. So next is Cameron, then Daniel. Yes, take over. <laughs> Hello. Um, just a couple of points and then I want to ask a question. The I really, first of all, thank you. This is awesome, and um, and I'm really excited about this. Um, the I really like this part of the conversation in terms of creating greater access and um, and clarity for the public, and thinking about how we can do that through the the communication and this idea we talked about per purpose of, of of a committee, but also we hear often confusion about, you know, why can't I speak more at a meeting, and why do I only have three minutes, and why don't you answer questions, and, 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 and you know, when do I get to have the conversations I want to have with, with, with assembly members and all of that. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in thinking about how our communications help to clarify a lot of that, and mm -hmm. why we're doing what we're doing, and how we're doing it. Um, and um, so that's one, one, one piece. And then the other one is, a bigger top topic that I, that I don't want to bring up right now because I think the topic will sort of take us into a different direction. Um, but I do want to bring it up. So I'm wondering if once you're done with your presentation, I, I want to make sure that I'm able to bring up that topic. And it's really about sort of our communication strategy in general in the current environment. Mm -hmm. And and so I, but I, I have a sense that that will t take us um, down a, a different path. <laughs> and so sure. I want to make sure that I have a chance to, to talk about that but I don't want to do it in, in the middle of your, your presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Cameron. And 
we've got Daniel and then Pete. And before um, we go to you, Daniel, I just want to check in with Claire and Allie on time. I know this portion was scheduled until 10.15. It includes um, some remarks from Dean as well. How are we doing on time? Um, we are running a little bit behind schedule, yes. Um, but uh, I am, you know, uh, towards the end of this presentation. So as um, assembly members share their, their comments, I'll go ahead and just um, kind of wrap up with some closing thoughts. Um, and uh, then we'll be able to move on. Thanks, Allie. And I know that um, this group values fluidity. <laughs> so, um, you know, if we need to adjust to better respond to people's interests, that's I'm totally supportive of that. Daniel, then Pete. Yeah, I'll try to make this quick because I, I want to hear more of your presentation. Um, but speaking to the audience on Twitter, I, I think that there are, number one, there's potentially folks on social media that maybe have never been to a community council mm -hmm. meeting or known the channels to become engaged who maybe that this could be their first exposure. Um, but I think it is that very engaged audience on Twitter. And right now on both, strangely, both on Twitter and TikTok, there is this whole sort of millennial <laughs> YIMBY movement going on. <laughs> and there's robust discussion of housing issues, traffic issues. Um, I've actually learned a lot from being on Twitter about Anchorage specific projects uh, that are going on and discussion that these, you know, advocates are, are, are batting around in this public space. And, and just today, we got a pretty detailed email from somebody that I've interacted with previously um, on Twitter. I didn't ask them to send us that email or anything, but it's, it's very detailed about um, potentially you know, a homelessness housing slash transportation related issue. And I think having um, that interaction with folks is, is pretty helpful because it also lets them know we're listening. It's another way for us to connect. So those are my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Pete? Thanks, Suzanne. And I just wanted to go back to the website for a second. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Kevin was saying that, you know, there's so much information there that but it takes a little while to find what you're looking for. Do we, is there a search engine so somebody can say, what day does the Community and Economic Development Committee meet mm. or, you know, mm. uh, is, is, is it, does it have that capability? Thanks. Great questions. I'm glad that um, we've uh, kind of turned to the website. Um, I uh, will just stay on the slide while I kind of talk about this. One of the things that I'm most excited about is that as um, we broached this idea of renovating the assembly website, IT got really jazzed about um, some of the ideas and, and um, kind of conceptual framework um, that we brought to them um, about implementing for the assembly. And so I think um, even though our role is to support the assembly, um, you know, I'm excited you know, more, thinking more long term about being a partner for the municipality to update the website and streamline it, make it more accessible, et cetera. Um, uh, as far as search platforms go, um, you know, I think internally um, on a website, uh, those search engines are always just a little finicky and tough. Um, but one of the things that is a really big priority moving forward with the assembly res website renovation is search engine optimization so that when you Google uh, Committee on Housing and Homelessness meeting today, right, that the first thing that comes up is the information that you need. Um, and so that's something that more long term, again, um, will take some training with the clerk staff, but um, is something that I could see us sustainably um, incorporating into the way that we use a website. Um, so to just uh, kind of quickly move through the, the conclusion of this uh, presentation, um, I, I see Twitter for many of the reasons that you all outlined um, as being uh, the first platform to maybe explore using um, as an assembly body as a whole. Um, as Claire mentioned yesterday, this is informational. It's you know nonpartisan. It's not meant to represent your beliefs or anything like that, but to be a bridge between your work and the public. And then further down the line, to look at platforms like Facebook that serves a different demographic, um, to look at um, platforms like Instagram that just fundamentally the algorithm works differently, so you produce different content, um, you know, could be options. But we'll learn a lot by um, dipping 
toes into one platform that then can be lessons learned to incorporate into other platforms as well. Um, circling back to the website, we did a, a little bit of a um, walkthrough of the new web design. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, it is going to be incremental. And so a lot of the things that you all have spoken to about um, engaging or connecting people to um, committee work, uh, you'll start to see some improvements pulling through. So one of the things uh, that is on the horizon that was considered low-hanging fruit by IT um, is to assign uh, the assembly events calendar into committee categories so that we can embed your assembly calendar for the committee on the committee page um, in a way that's automated and then also alleviates clerk staff from having to update. Next meeting is on this day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so on the assembly homepage, uh, the assembly calendar will be embedded there and people can go to the assembly homepage, you know, just the main website and see what events are coming up that day and what meetings are happening that day. So some really exciting things. And my goal is to see this breakdown of where people are going, what type of content they're looking for when they visit the assembly website to evolve and change. Right now, the majority of people, almost 60%, are looking for meeting information. And if we can present that front and center, um, that I think alleviates a lot of the digging that Kevin was talking about, where you're weeding through and trying to find the right page. There were, at one point, Claire and I were looking, there were like three different meetings pages to be looking at, right? Um, so to consolidate and streamline that experience um, hopefully means that then we're seeing an increase in people um, accessing issue-based information, right? Learning about the Assembly's focus on housing and homelessness and how it pulls together from lots of different committees and what kind of work is being done um, so that then their engagement in those committees is more informed and more meaningful um, and engaging. Pete asked yesterday about um, the number of visitors, and I misspoke. I was um, I had the wrong number in mind. Um, here in this time period, which is from a couple months ago when I first started preparing this um, presentation, April 30th to June 30th, um, almost 7,000 unique vi visitors to the assembly website. So again, something that we'll continue to monitor. Yeah, nearly 7,000. Does that include, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Does that, you, does that include uh, the streams, the YouTube streams for our meetings? That does not include um, streaming, although that would be another interesting thing to right. keep in mind. There were a couple of times when we were seeing upwards of 15 to 20,000 people in a four hour period oh. tuning in to our efforts. And so um, we might ask, I don't know who did it last time, somebody to generate a report of mm. our uh, participation on the streams over the course of the last couple of years just to see a good analytic of that because that's where people are really engaging with their work I think and then um, I did find a slight clunk in the new layout and that is the way we present the number of pages mm -hmm. so it's by district number mm -hmm. and for the most part people don't know mm -hmm. the district numbers mm -hmm. and so um, it added several steps to get to where I want to go mm -hmm. where it was which is not generally a good idea, but sometimes it's worthy. But I think coming up with a method to help people also visualize or attach to the name South Anchorage Green River, because the numbers don't communicate to most people. That's a very wonky bit of information yeah. to know the district number. You're in. Well, and it's easy enough, you know, on that page, um, there are tabs, right? And so just for like, consistency, it was nice for them each to be the same size and have the same like number, right? Um, but to update that to the actual district name is easy. That's and awesome. I think you can leave the number and just put it as a line break below or whatever way it works, but I think yeah. a little bit more information will yeah. people get there quicker. That's super helpful. Cool. Um, I identify, again, I love three buckets, uh, three goals that, um, you know, these analytics will then go toward measuring, right? And that's how we know that we're making progress. That's the opportunity um, to come back to a rules committee and reevaluate um, how this is going um, and come back to it. So um, ultimately, I mean, the overarching goal, right, is to empower people to be a part of visioning um, what 
they want their city to, to be and look like. Um, today we are in September, which is wild, um, and we are in phase one um, of this kind of pilot process. So updating um, the website, um, the look, the feel, the, the way that the content content is laid out and the way that users navigate it um, and feedback like what Chris offered is exactly what we're looking for in the next couple of months, right? Um, also, before I go on leave, <laughs> um, I would love to provide you all with, um, you know, a more finalized version of the communications plan um, that includes a style guide and some of these templates for um, you all to use if you have, you know, presentations or press releases or any of those things that are coming up. Then looking to 2023 is where we get into this, um, you know, more detailed implementation. And um, you'll note in the communications plan, it kind of outlines month by month what we're looking at. Um, I'll just highlight um, that I would love to offer kind of a, a Q1 report um, in early spring. And um, that will include some movement on these committee pages. Um, and so uh, across the clerk's office, um, we've maintained uh, a conversation about what the website could look like and how it could better serve them. Um, and so they sound really excited about updating the, the committee um, web pages and presence and um, streamlining their um, ease as well. So I'm hoping to be able to report back on that um, in Q1 of 2023. Thank you so much, Thanks. Ellie. We've got Meg. Just mm -hmm. really, you know, okay, so just really briefly, uh, I appreciate like how you set out the numbers by the districts. If the district number bar, the green one at the top, could also take you to find like a blow up map of the district, mm -hmm. especially after redistricting, that would be really helpful. Finding your district on that other map mm -hmm. is not like the ones you gave us for our office walls. Mm -hmm. Like if that map could be there, then you can get more into what the streets are. Yeah. Is we're still, well, I'm still working on understanding where everything is from redistricting. Yeah, and one of the things that isn't covered in this presentation but is included in the communications plan um, are more physical um, publications, including we have had this idea for a mailer ahead of the election season um, to let people know if their district has changed, <laughs> right, if they're in a new district. Um, yeah, and so, um, you know, I think that that's, um, again, kind of looking at... Um, your priorities and ways to um, engage people. That clarification is so important. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, thanks. And to that point, Meg, I had on my notes that uh, rather than, or maybe a picture could pop up or something, um, but also on the pages, each page should have a link to the GIS map that pops up with exactly your district. Mm -hmm. So you can zoom on your address and know if you're in there specifically because those boundary lines get tricky. And also the My Neighborhood link which uh, mm. is a little bit hard to find, where you can put your address in and it will pop up to you which district you're in by address. I think it's valuable. And then finally, your point on the postcard, I would defer that question to the elections team because they do, in fact, send out a postcard. Mm -hmm. uh, Jamie, they do, in fact, send out a postcard for every election uh, before to let people know and to get a response if someone's moved or whatnot. So we might want to add to that mm. mailer that we're already sending yeah. thousands of dollars on something about your district may have changed and here's how you verify. Daniel, did you have your hand up? Oh, okay. Allie, were you able to? I'm taking notes. I will say there is a big yellow button on that um, members page that says find your district. That is that GIS, the, the GIS site. So I have so many constituents who cannot use the GIS site. Yeah, and, and so, so that was why I was asking for the picture because then I have to try to explain to them how to use the GIS. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, that's um, great feedback and uh, easy, you know, um, low hanging fruit for sure. Allie, thank you so much for the presentation and for all the work that you're doing on this. I mean, clearly, it's an area of interest and um, concern to members. So appreciate all your work. Um, are there any plans for TikTok? <laughs> for China <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> At lunch, over lunch. No, is, is that allowed? I mean, because, I mean, we all know what the department of yeah. 
We all know what the Department of Defense is saying about TikTok and how mm. it is actually, it is quite terrifying. It has, mm. Once it's on your phone, it has access to any phone that's connected to it, and it sells all your data. There are municipalities and cities that forbid TikTok on any government computers and devices. Mm. So I'm really surprised we're using that, considering it is a... No, we're not. We're not. We're not. We're not. It was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to be really clear. I was just trying to signal to you all that I've heard of TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like the old curmudgeon over here. I'm like my home with my kids. Can I? <laughs> when um, I was doing the acting mayor thing, IT forbade me from using Zoom. <laughs> I was like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, everyone uses Zoom. So mm -hmm. I don't and think they used that it. Point, that's a very important point. We don't use even Zoom. Because IT has yeah, to dictate that it's not secure enough for the purposes of government. And uh, so, similarly, I'm Did sure this like conversation has or will happen with any specific app. Thing. But I guess you would have to request it anyway. Okay, so thanks again, yeah. Allie. We'll go back to Cameron, who um, mm -hmm. wanted to address an aspect of our communications plan. Yeah, and it does relate to this presentation because. And I'm trying to think of a really good analogy, but I can't. I can't think of one. That, but something around you know, you're 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 in the middle of a war while you're in, and you're and you're trying to function in, in a normal way, right? And this is a very wonderful sort of strategy for how to address communications in what feels in in a in a normal way. But I don't think we're in a normal mm. environment. And so I guess I, I want to speak just for myself about what I see as our environment and. And I want to ask whether that has been thought about as this plan has been developed. And if not, then what are we doing about that environment? And, and how are we um, not just ignoring it? Um, and so I see us, I, I think that we are currently in a communications war. And I, would, and I use that word specifically because I think that, that um, there has been an active campaign that's been happening over the last year to um, to undermine and to um, break uh, trust between the public and the assembly. And I believe that this administration has been working on that for the entire time they've, they've been in office. And so, so much of what has happened is this very intentional sort of work to, to break any sort of, of aspect of trust by lying and, and, and sending out information that is just clearly wrong. And so, and so what I want to try to figure out is, what are we doing about that? Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that oftentimes we, we, there, it's been characterized as, as political. When it's not political, it's incompetence. What we're seeing is, is is a, a huge amount of, of incompetence. And we, I think, are a body that actually functions very well. And I think we are professional. I think that we are engaged. I think that we care deeply about the, this community and about the work that we, we do. And we are being characterized as being political or being incompetent or being whatever. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how if we just ignore this, because I think that's a strategy. I think a strategy is continue to function in a really productive way with integrity and honesty and just, just keep on going. Mm. Um, the problem is, is that that work, that communications work to, to undermine this body and to, and to lie to this community um, doesn't just affect us, it affects the assembly in the future, and the future in the future. And, and so that's what I'm concerned about. I'm not concerned about me. I'm concerned about the fact that, that, that this work that is being done really does impact the long-term effectiveness of not only this body, but our community as, as a whole. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about um, and, and there may be people, I'm sure there are people in this room that don't, don't agree, and they, they think things are, are fine, and they think that it's a, a spat between two bodies, and they think that it's a, you know, we're political, and he's, he's political, and we're just going back and forth. But that's not, from my perspective, the truth at all. Um, and, and so the other piece that I want to add, and I mentioned, 
in incompetence. And I say that word specifically because this, um, this administration is, um, is in, my, in many ways destroying our city, I think. This, the, the staff are leaving, the decades of experience are flowing out of this, the, the city, and, and our departments, we're hearing from them, are just struggling to even survive. And so, how do we talk about that? So, that's what I want to make sure that that's on the record. And, and what I'm trying to figure out is, do we just not address that within our, our communications work and, and do that separately? Do we not agree as a body on that at all? So we all have to kind of do our own individual work on that. Um, but I do believe, as I said in the beginning, that we are in a time and a place where um, I would particularly the, my, my, my strategy is usually to, to, to ignore it, right? And to just continue to, 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 to do the work. Um, but I'm finding that we're in a time when it's hurting not only us, but our, our city. So I'll, I'll leave you the mic at that and see what others think. Yeah, may I respond? Um, I, I think that maybe what's changed, um, as I mentioned, I've had the, the opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with some of you um, about this. Um, and I think what's changed in the last year is that you, as an assembly, now have more resources. Um, and so by having, um, you know, Claire and myself on staff, we've been able to, I, I think, maybe just move the needle on whether a communication strategy is reactionary or a word that I um, heard that I really like, proactionary. Um, and maybe one example of that um, is the property tax um, letter that the mayor sent out. That is, um, you know, a communication strategy that was aimed at um, defaming the assembly, right? Um, and so to then respond directly to people who were um, reaching out about that issue, um, you know, is not something that I expect you all would have been able to accomplish comprehensively without um, legislative services support previously. Um, and then to also turn that around and, um, you know, through your policy proposal, um, present a solution or, or address that issue to those people that were concerned. We then also reached out to everybody who emailed about the property tax letter and said this proposal is coming forward on Tuesday. Um, and so uh, I, I think that there's an exciting shift just in um, resource availability. Um, and I say that as I am about to go on leave for a couple months, right? Um, so 2023, looking forward to um, kind of growing and, and continuing that work. I'd like to add to that too. Some, some of what you're asking might be beyond what legislative services can do because it needs to come from individuals because you might not all feel the same. And we really have to, um, the things that we put out have to be pretty accepted by all of you. But um, I'm, I can send you this article, but I just read it a couple weeks ago that the University of Cambridge and Google teamed up and did some research. And they did, they did find that pre-bunking um, Anticipated lies and just getting correct information out there is actually becoming scientifically proven to be effective. And so I feel like that's really where Allie and I are focusing is um, just making sure to get the correct information out there so that you or others in the community can then pick it up and, and take it maybe with a more political angle. Um, and then I do work with the press, too, to make sure that they have the correct information, mm. which I think before you had staff, they weren't always getting it. And so they're just going with whatever. I mean, we've all seen it. Um, they'll print our press releases and they'll print the mayor's press releases word for word. And so by having more press releases and making sure that I'm giving them the information there, I feel like their stories have become more accurate um, or at least, yeah, more accurate, but also representing the mm -hmm. assembly's perspective as well. Thanks, Claire. So Cameron, your questions have lit up the queue. <laughs> and I just want to do a quick check in on time. Um, I'm guessing that there's a lot of interest in um, discussing this. So I just want to acknowledge we're a little bit, a little bit off schedule. Um, but we'll go ahead and proceed. Could, could I just interject really quickly? So Dean was going to give about five minutes of his, he shortened his report, he's just five minutes. Um, you have gone into your break now, so I guess you'll need to decide if you want to further this discussion or save it for a different day and then focus on the next session, which is going to be the 2022 work plan. So that's just a decision you should probably make now before you get too far into the discussion. Okay. Um, 
I would ask for a motion, but I'm a little bit worried about that. I'm joking. I have to work on my material, obviously. Um, so controversial. Um, Claire's point is well taken. Do we want to continue through the queue? Do we want to and, and, and go through the break and just kind of take breaks as needed? Go to Dean now, come back to this. Preference? I'll be quick. Vice Chair. I'll be very quick. So, okay, I'm hearing go through the queue. Okay, so we'll do that. I have Chris, Randy, Forrest, Austin, and Daniel, <laughs> and then anyone else, of course, who wants in. Go ahead, Chris. So, first, for the record, so everyone knows because they can't see the emails, uh, we invited the administration to participate in this process several times and in several different ways, and they opted not to participate. So, any frank conversation about our experience with the administration that might seem by this record unaddressed or unrebutted and that a rebuttal may come another day, they were invited and they opted not to participate. And so uh, Cameron's question really is, do we say nothing? Do we respond as a group? What is our strategy? And um, I think that the leadership has been working hard to respond and pre, but as much as possible. Um, it's tricky with the legislative services staff because as they mentioned they do work for all of us and it puts them in a diff difficult spot when even members are having dueling press releases and we have some great care to apply to this issue in the sense that when Suzanne was traveling we had this press release that was drafted and it had information that was not distributed to the public and it wasn't our place to distribute to the public and so I intervened and said we can't send that out and uh, the, the item ended up, the individual said, well, the chief of police said it was okay. It was related to a police shooting. And okay. I checked with the chief of police and I said, did you release this information? And he said, no, after the fact, but the way it was presented to the chief at the time, the response was, that's fine. So the chief then sent back to the member, take this information out and then it's good to go. And so we have to exercise great care when we speak and communicate through this office. You as a member can put out a press release on your own letterhead that says whatever you want, whatever you want. But when it comes through these two staff in that department, it has to be carefully crafted not to violate privileges, not to give out information that you have by virtue of your position that's not generally public. And so there is a conversation to be had about the propriety and methods of utilizing legislative services to communicate broadly, mm. which is a nuance to what Mr. Prisberti was saying, but it's I think, a very important part of this conversation. Thanks, Chris. Randy? I'll be brief for that. <laughs> so I, I just follow Cameron. The administration, I think, definitely has a communication problem. And I always believe in taking the high road. And to me, that is, we continue to reach out. We continue to make offers. You try to lead them to water. We can't make them drink. Um, but at work, what we've seen is kind of what Claire touched on. It's that single source of truth. Mm -hmm. So there shouldn't be three pages with calendars. There should be one. <laughs> there shouldn't be, Austin asked the question quite a time, few, few times on the budget. What budget will you implement? That's not even a question. There's only one budget, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just lining everyone up to say, here's, if we point everyone that comes to the web page, here is the budget, here is that answer. There's not five out there, and it makes it, it makes it really hard to dispute the facts, mm -hmm. and I think that's what Claire was talking to. Thanks. Thanks, Randy. Forrest? Yeah, I want to start by thank you, thanking Mr. Perez for Dia for a very eloquent and passionate statement that I totally agree with. Um, my uh, experience in this realm will always be colored by the summer of 2020, um, and I'll always see everything that happens for the rest of my political life through that lens, I think. Uh, 2020 and early 2021, mm -hmm. and the the way that disinformation was used against the assembly. And I hope it was a lesson to all of us to not give six minutes to every person to stand up and lie um, uh, forever. Um, that being said, uh, I do think it is tricky to use our legislative staff uh, in this realm for a lot of the reasons have already been discussed. Um, but I am so appreciative that we have them because we didn't have anything like that in 2020. And it was just, the, the assembly was just a punching bag. 
and I didn't feel like the prior administration, they, they were under a lot of pressure because of the pandemic, but I didn't feel like they had an effective communication strategy, particularly at the early part of that, to do the pre stuff you're talking about. It, there was basically none of that. And so, you know, they say a lie gets around the world twice before the truth gets its pants on. And, and that's what happened uh, over and over and over and over and over, and then it metastasized into a, uh, into a political movement. Um, I will say one successful strategy that I have found working with Ms. Quinn Davidson is using um, our position as uh, the heads of committees. And so when an issue comes, it's clearly the, the property tax being, I think the clearest example, the property tax memo that went out or letter went out. Um, it was very clear that that touched on the budget committee. And so we formulated a letter using, uh, you know, with the help of the legislative staff, and just tried to sort of lay out what we saw as as the truth, but we were clear that it wasn't coming from the assembly as a whole. It was coming from the, the budget leadership. And then we gave it, I think other folks ended up using that letter too if they wanted to. Um, but it was so useful and helpful to have legislative staff there, which we didn't have in 2020 or 2021, to help us craft that. And so I guess that would be one thing I would suggest is that the leadership of committees, um, when you see an, a topic that's clearly within your purview, to work with legislative mm -hmm. uh, staff uh, on a message that's clearly coming from you um, and is well crafted and that potentially could be used by others on the body. Thank you, Forrest. Austin? Thanks, um, Suzanne. And yeah, I appreciate Cameron's comments and Forrest as well. Um, I actually want to challenge the premise uh, that we can't have Claire and Allie help us with communications if some members disagree. I believe that this body acts by the majority and we pass resolutions and we pass legislation through majority vote. And so I don't believe that a member or when two members or however many of the minority should have veto power over the way that we communicate with the public. And I think um, your job is to work with the chair to portray the facts, but also to talk about what we have done as a body. And so I just want us to get away from like, oh, you know, Claire and Allie can't, it, we don't want them to talk. It feels like we're nervous about them sharing information on things we've passed and that we're doing. And like, so I guess I would, it doesn't have to be here, but maybe in rules, appreciate some additional conversation on mm -hmm. what people's views on that are and what, you know, if there are any legal pieces, although I really, I think it's probably just a rule against campaigning with government employees, which I don't think you're going to be doing. So um, anyway, I, I want us to be thinking about that and challenge our own opinions about it. Thanks, Austin. Next is Daniel, then Meg. Thank you. Yeah, I think this all just speaks to why we do need to have a robust communications plan. And, and I would argue for presence on social media. I, I do think there's going to, you know, there's a temptation to sort of combat misinformation, and that would be easy for us to be pulled into sort of this downward spiral. I think that proactionary, <laughs> what was it, pre... I forget. Proactionary is the there word. There was another yes. key word that, you, that Claire used. Pre-bonk. Uh, Pre-bonk. Mm. Proactionary, pre -bonk. Just getting the information out mm. um, and, and sort of um, letting people know what we're working on and... and and touting our own accomplishments. You know, some of us saw that the the mayor's office did a video of their, their one year of accomplishments. And, you know, some of those accomplishments maybe were rollover, rollovers from, from previous administrations. But um, I, I think there's an opportunity for us to, to just inform the public, here's what we're passionate about on here's what, what we're working on here you come to a meeting and uh, just getting that information out um and and putting a positive spin on that and not getting pulled into this this tug of war is personally where where i would like to come from from our group channel thanks daniel meg thanks i'd like to add it to the conversation about using legislative services um, for a rules committee about district-based communication. So if the two members of the district agree, is that um, something that's allowable and, and usable? It, because it may conflict with other districts, but um, I think that's something that we should explore. Thanks, Meg. Did anyone um, else who hasn't spoken want to get into the queue? Chris has asked to go back a second time. Okay, go ahead, Chris. It's, yeah, just to the point made by Austin, I, I really agree with you, and the idea is to 
have that conversation where we set around the parameters and we don't and cover ourselves with too much fear and limitations. But at the same time, the thing that gets me is the imprimatur of legislative services, right? If it's something that is hot and very specific to an individual, it's that imprimatur that I think is the problem. And we can talk about that later where they can help if it fits within their work plan and their day and all of that thing. But when you send it out with that legislative services title, to me, it changes the nature of the communication, and we have to be very careful when we think about that piece itself. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think the difference is, is if it's coming from a member, great. They can even help to draft it if they have the bandwidth. But where does it come from is really important for us to consider. Um, one thought I had is, you know, at um, in the legislature, not that we want to copy the legislature because we get a whole lot more shit done in the legislature. Um, but they do have a you know, coalition um, press person, right? And that person's putting out stuff for the majority. And so it'd be interesting to hear, like, how do they address this? And, um, and I don't know that it's as big of an issue, sort of conceptually it's interesting, but I feel like if you all are just talking about what we're doing and what we're passing, it's, it shouldn't be that controversial. Um, one more thing, one of my biggest pet peeves, reactionary means conservative inherently. So if people don't know that, don't ever use it outside of that. It has a political bent to it and it means specifically conservative. Thank you. Thanks, Austin. Cameron and then Felix. Okay. Yeah, just thanks uh, for all of the comments. The, the, the piece that I'm still struggling with and, I, and, um, and I'll have to just continue to think about this is that, that um, you know when when do we when do we respond and say that's not true or that's not that's a mischaracterization or that that you know and and when do we not um, and that's the piece that I think I can continue to, to struggle with and I think that um, I, I have previously been in the camp of people will figure it out people will see it, you know this is really obvious that that this is not you know true or it's or it's characterized wrong and I have changed that drastically at this point because of the co the constant flow of this. And so I do think that, I, I think that, you know, we need to continue to combat this this characterization that, that, that we're, we and the mayor are, are spatting back and forth. It's not about us. It's about, it's about the city. It's about telling the truth. It's about making sure people can get good, good information. Um, and so I think the way that we make sure to not say, anything negative about him or the administration, but it's more about this is what's true, this is what is right, this is the right way to do it, but also not leaving things on the, the table anymore. And I really appreciate those members that, whether it's in a meeting or whether it's in our, in our press releases, um, say, that's not correct, or that's, you're, 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 you're twisting that around, and, and we need to make sure that, that, that the information is clear. So I, I think, uh, making sure that we're doing that on a consistent basis is really important. And I would just end with, um, again, I'm less concerned about us and, and this, this, this body and more so with the long-term reputation mm -hmm. and ability for, for this assembly to, to function in, in the future. And I really want my kids to, to come to assembly meetings and to be proud of our, of our city and, and the work that we're, we're doing. Um, and this meeting is a great example of the fact that this is a highly functioning group. Uh, we're, we're different, we have different opinions, but this is a really, um, this is a group of people that our city should be proud of. And, and I think we need to take seriously um, that building that trust back um, should be one of our, our priorities. And I appreciate that, that you've, you've added that here um, in an environment where, where, where it's actively being, um, uh, attacked, and I think that, that that's that's an ongoing thing to, to just keep keep on our minds. Thanks. Thanks, Cameron. Next is Felix and Pete, and then Kevin. Thanks. Um, so I guess a couple of things. You know, I, I find this uh, conversation particularly interesting because one of the things that we usually not usually, but um, when the clerk's office was responsible for organizing these, we usually would have. Um, a sort of a media outreach panel where members of the media would come in. And I think a lot of a lot of the discussion that we're having today sort of fits that mold um, because, you know, members will have their own ways of doing things, but 
Um, you know, I know that there are some members, including myself, when you know a press release comes out from the mayor, you know, one of the first things I will do is like, well, that's interesting. That's obviously going to become a news story, right? Mm -hmm. Step one. Step two is, well, if I want to get my perspective out, then I better call Emily. I better call Lori, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's and I know several Zelly members do that, right? So, so that's one thing. And then um, second thing is, you know, I'm actually oh, right now in the middle of drafting a press release that will be going out. What I always do is I do all of the work, send it to legislative services and ask them to send it out. It would be very, for me, it's very weird to think that assembly members would, unless it was like sort of a, a fits in the parameters of like a committee thing or assembly leadership thing of individual assembly members asking legislative services to, to draft and, and, and do that work. So. I think just having a little bit more nuance, perhaps in a future discussion on that, I think would be helpful for the mm -hmm. body. Thanks, Felix. Next is Pete and then Kevin. Uh, thanks, Suzanne. You know, and, and stepping back and kind of looking at what we're discussing from a 20,000 foot view, it, it sounds like we're talking about creating an assembly blog, so to speak. Mm. <laughs> you know, Wow. You two ladies are the truth squad. <laughs> yeah. you know? I, I, I don't know if that's what we're actually doing, but that's sort of what it sounds like. Just you know, yeah. just from, need to make it from my point time. of view. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Kevin. Well, I'm probably of all this here the furthest removed from any kind of uh, you know politics or political uh, you know we'd say motives, but you know. It's kind of sad, really, the relationship between the assembly and the administration. I've told the administration, you listen, our success and failure in this relationship happens one conversation at a time. If you don't show up to the conversation, there's not a relationship. Okay? And so, you know, I'll do everything we can to, I'll do everything I can to bridge that gap. It's frustrating that they're not here, and it's frustrating they don't show up at other things. Um, it's, but you know, all I can do is control our actions and how we respond. And when I look at the way we respond, sometimes it's not always helpful, right? And I think it's really important that as frustrated as we get, my children don't always behave the way I wish they would behave, but I know that they, I know that they have great potential within them, and I know that as long as I'm patient and I'm loving and I'm really concerned about what's in the best interest of our family, I'll break through. But they're going to do it the way, they're gonna do things the way they wanna do. But it's always very careful before we send out and we speak from the cuff. We speak when we're in, uh, at the podium with the mic and you get heated that you always think before you speak. And that it is true, it is helpful, it is inspiring, it is necessary, and it is kind. But we don't always do that. We are not always kind. We do not always inspire the best out of people. And despite that people don't behave the way that we want or administration doesn't do the way or doesn't show up when we want them to show up, we do not bridge that relationship by, by fueling animus. And I would just encourage us all, we can't control what administration does, but we can control the way that we react. We always act in an inspiring, necessary kind of way. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Meg, then Chris. So I have a little bit of a reaction to that because I can compartmentalize each issue that comes before us I can help the administration fix something that's wrong on the dais. I can go to bat and do all of that to keep the business of the city running. I can also critique the administration and I can use strong language when I think it's appropriate um, and each member speaks for itself. Um, and I think maybe the public doesn't always see the ability of that compartmentalization but also I think each of us as individual members, I think this is you know, where there's a difference between speaking as a body and speaking as a representative for our constituents. Um, we get, I mean, that's the privilege we hold and the responsibility we hold with our positions is to speak on our own behalf and what we believe in and what we have been elected to do. And so I appreciate that you, know, you should take a beat and think about that 
um, and you should try to be as respectful as possible. But when it's time to sometimes call a spade a spade or whatever it may be, you know, I don't think that that necessarily suggests that as a member, we're not cooperating in every other issue that may come forward. I remember a meeting not so long ago where I helped the administration correct like four items and then spoke passionately against something they were trying to do um, and speaking about untruths. I feel like I can hold both those lanes at the same time and that it's my job to do both. Um, so I just want to provide that perspective as well. Thanks, Meg. Chris? Yeah, it's, it's such an interesting topic. And the, we have like an example that's not even 24 hours old. And that is the state, DOT, sends out an extraordinary press release that states that they are t attending to take that property to Golden Line. The letter, sorry. Yeah, the state sent this letter, Wolfgang, the region director. And my experience tells me for the last 15 years, they have said we, won't, we cannot legally send out any communication that states we intend to take a property unless we have the money and we have the project because it's an inverse condemnation. They literally have stolen the value of that property from us by sending that letter. But if you read the letter, it states there is no project, it's not in the stip, and they want us to join them in the effort. What immediately happens thereafter is the administration sends out a press release. Oh my God, we really want to implement the anchor home plan and do the substance abuse work, but we can't because DOT tells us that project is off the table. That's all falsehood. There's no truth to that because what DOT said in their letter is this is a plan we want to implement, but we don't have a project and join us in it. And so how do you rebut a plain lie? Now we're getting emails today that state Golden Lane can't be used, now what? And so if the lie is effective, it actually has immediately percolated into the truth in a lot of people's minds. And that's the point I think that I'm hearing, what, what is our process and method for rebutting that? And it's a true challenge. Like I was chatting with Suzanne last night at, at nine o'clock. Do we do a press release on this that mm. rebuts this? How do we do this? And warning press releases is not necessarily the way, but this is the reality we face, and it's not kind or generous. It's, it's lies that we have to rebut. And it's almost every day. Thanks, Chris. Austin, and then I'm um, hopeful we can maybe move on. <laughs> um, whoops. So a couple of things. I appreciate what Kevin um, what you're saying, and I think in an ideal world, that is what we would all do. And you know, for me, when I was in a okay, thank you, thanks, Suzanne. Um, in an ideal world, I think that that is true. I think the and you know, when I was in acting mayor role, which by the way, the same people who are now in administration were percolating lies during that time in front of all of us, and then they became the government. So it's really hard for us after years of, and I mean constant lies, like get up, say something that is completely untrue, and we all know it to be untrue, and then getting into government to try to break government. And it's really hard for those of us who have been enduring that for years, literally years, to be like, oh, you know what? I bet Mayor Bronson, I bet they just messed up. They didn't get back to us on this. But you know, they have good intentions. They don't have good intentions. And that's the problem. And, and you may disagree with that. And, and that's OK. We're allowed to disagree. But, but uh, years of experience has taught us that they don't, unfortunately. Um, the homelessness experience has taught us that they don't. You know, they dropped off people last night during that downpour. All I could think about was those people and what they did. And it's hard to then be like, oh, but I'll, okay, next proposal, next failed proposal, bring it forward and I'll just consider it like you're, you're doing your best. And anyway, I think um, there's so much baggage that has come from a lot of real experiences we've had with these folks that has made it really difficult to to be open to new ideas that they bring and have trust in them. I know you said you wanted to move on, but can I quickly 
I'm a Rotarian. I don't know if there's any other Rotarians in the room, but we have our four-way test, right? The things we think, say, or do. So first, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? So I think that might be sort of a good lens to look at our, at least our group communication through. Thank you, Cameron. For the record, it was requested. Um, thanks for that, Daniel. I appreciate you bringing it up. I know it's along the lines of what you were saying, Kevin, as well, um, some of the points. I was a Rotarian for a bit and, and think that that's a really productive and useful mm -hmm. approach. And, you know, I'll just close by saying, um, as assembly leadership, we are always open and available for conversations with the administration. And, um, sorry, I'm going to do a baby hand up. Aww. He's doing so well. Even though you've been grouch, mm -hmm. distracting, it still is nice to you. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe every day is an opportunity. I hate the fact that we are in a conflict that many of us don't want because we are here to do the work for our community. That said, um, you know, I just agree that getting out information is so, so important. And I think back to two years ago, Humpy, when the Title 28, what we know now as the annual elections code review mm -hmm. came out and there wasn't um, a whole lot of initial information because it had just been a regular thing that was done and all of a sudden, um, because of elections and voting in the news, it became a really big issue. And unfortunately, the bloggers had the first commentary on that. And so we learned from that to, ahead of time, help people understand that this is part of the annual process. There are multiple opportunities for public engagement and to really provide um, whereas statements too that help people understand in an, an AM that, you know, what is going on with it. So thank you for all your work in helping us get that information out. I think, however, we end up on in, in this conversation. That's super important. So Claire, I'll hand the schedule back to you. <laughs> and um, hopefully we can go, I think, now to, to Dean. Just real quick, I'm going to step out. I got a call from my kid's school, so I'm just going to uh -oh. stop. <laughs> Dean is without an interpreter today, so I'm sending him messages through Teams. So if you have questions during his presentation, I'll type them up and send it to him via Teams, but he only needed a few minutes, he said. Oh, thank you. So uh, I, I was invited today to speak for a few minutes, so I'm going to speak for a few minutes. So uh, hopefully this will be quick. I think it's also... Uh, well, unfortunately, I don't have a sign language interpreter here today due to some scheduling miscommunications, so I apologize for that. But um, I worked something out. There's always alternatives, right, to uh, overcome obstacles and things like communication obstacles. So if we have questions, um, uh, raise your hand, interrupt, ask me to speak louder, and Claire's going to help me understand what I'm typing it into Teams chat here. So thank you, Claire. I appreciate that. And uh, hopefully, though, I don't think we will have a lot of this part. Um, and mostly uh, giving an overview of the Assembly Council's office and what we do. Uh, we, I guess, that's me and one staff member, and we have another one kind of missing in Chandler. Um, but the, uh, I, I think generally that most of you have worked in my office for several years now, and uh, we have three newer members who have worked with them a little bit off and on. Uh, the emails and a couple of projects uh, since we started in terms last, um, last May. So I think that everyone here is probably familiar with the um, office and the Assembly Council's role. We do have, though, a uh, codified here. Um, 
that Jim would do the Symposium Council, seen how it or code section 220 or 65, um, we actually took this at uh, a um, code amendment in 2017, uh, created our own section for the Senate Council's office. Um, and it was created in 2001, the uh, so first half of uh, the Assembly's own uh, legal advisor on staff, uh, you know, all the time. So instead of having to contract out or uh, teach the Department of Law. So anyways, the duties here in this code section are uh, the general duties of the Assembly Council shall consist of providing legal advice to the Assembly, drafting ordinances, resolutions, and memoranda, and other working documents, conducting legal research and providing opinions to the Assembly and the Board of Adjustment, and assisting the municipal clerk as directed by the presiding officer of the Assembly. And so that's it in a nutshell, that's our code guidance for what I'm supposed to do. And I think that the most important thing to understand about uh, this is that the Assembly Council is um, the attorney for the Assembly, you know, the body. It's like its own entity, so if, like when you have now the CEO Corporation, it's its own entity. The Assembly it is, is in a way its own entity. As a government, it's very, um, Different though than a uh, single corporation, of course, uh, they're all formed of separation of powers. We've seen this um, discussed so many times over the past, I guess, year or a little more than a year mm -hmm. at the, how the executive branch and the uh, legislative branch interact and so forth. We're our own entity as the legislative branch, right? But we're not our own entity as a um, an entity that has the capacity to sue and be sued, to own property and so forth. Uh, we do have, I guess, as a legislative branch, the simply the capacity to um, sue the executive branch. Mm -hmm. So we have sort of the limited uh, legal existence, and I'm here to help advise and assist in that limited legal existence. Um, but I am also the Assembly Council's office is also intended to help each individual member with um, your, I guess, actions that contribute to the Assembly as the legislative body, right? So drafting ordinances, each one bring forward, and sometimes they come forward, and sometimes they don't. We're asking questions about how you can carry out those sort of functions. Of course. Excuse me. Um, and I know that uh, most of you have already seen now in practice uh, well, we exist with the ordinance. We have a good question. How does this simply accomplish something? Or are we able to do something? Or are we going to do this by state law or not? That may be one of the more common questions uh, that we get. You have a specific area or purpose. So we see that with, for example, um, the uh, exception added for uh, property owners to do their own work, right? And then our Board of Building Regulations and Examiners and Review. Uh, board of Building Regulations Examiners and Review. Mm -hmm. I got that name right. Uh, with them saying, well, we won't have to do that. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, preempted by state law or violation of state law. So, anyways, um, that's one of those more public examples of a preemption question. But we get those all the time. And I think that's in our experience interacting with my office. You see most of my work through our emails, so legal advice. And I guess in our changing world, um, since the days I went to law school, that uh, a lot more legal advice is done with email communica mm. communications. And uh, I guess that would be like the short term round type legal advice. And sometimes there's um, a longer, I guess, analysis that's sort of uh, warranted by the question of the issues for body mm -hmm. and uh, I hope those as well. You see those sometimes when I don't even know that that was distributed you know, confidentially or publicly, like the alien that went with um, at some of the mayor's detail of lives for the special meeting we had for those. And mostly we weren't in the circumstances where it was truly a question of uh, the mayor saying this was a legal this and I have a different opinion and what to like counter that. So um, I, I, I don't need to sort of hit these points haphazardly, but I'm trying to use examples with help. And that would be more of the general advice to the body. 
But I also, of course, have emails with each of you, most of you, um, with specific questions that I try to answer. And then we have sometimes um, co drafting projects for an individual, but also sometimes for several co sponsors. And so this is one of the more challenging parts for me as an attorney. Uh, you have an attorney client relationship, right? And I got that to the body. We see that one rather than Tuesday night meetings on the dice. Um, but when I have an attorney client relationship with one member as an individual with the project, um, well, I have all that uh, duty to the client, right? And uh, confidentiality of our communications. And to me, it's important that I own those, um, I guess, principles of um, Tony's duties. And for me, it's very important that I not like, discuss your project outside with uh, persons outside of, I guess, maybe our email communication so we can hide about it. And they should tell me to do so. And, and it's not my place to take over the dialogue and um, talk about the project to others. No, that's, that's what you do when you're the uh, elected representatives. That's what you do when you just here to assist with the questions as well. So that you can do that accurately and publicly. And it's also, I guess, important to me uh, and this office to honor our uh, uh, Open Meetings Act requirements. And that means, of course, when we have co-sponsors, I limit it to three of you, you probably this all the time, you know, more than three members, it's an open exact violation, you start to deliberate and consider some action that the body, the whole assembly can take. And so it's an ordinance resolution. I mean, I can draft it with three co-sponsors, and we have several of those. But um, more is not something we can do. There is, of course, a little exception with we're doing that consideration and deliberation um, in the open meeting, in the public meeting. And uh, there's a recent example of this with um, the Community Economic Development Committee, where uh, with that uh, building board's uh, assertion that we had an amendment that violates the law and the county decided we want to do an ordinance. So we have all the county members sponsoring that. And so, of course, there's that little exception for coach drafting work um, where I have more than three members as sponsors. And then there's a lot of times that I uh, can point out to, well, there's some other exceptions if we do this way or that way. And um, it always comes down to, well, the details and arguing about the details and how things work. But as a general matter, uh, attorneys are risk adverse, so I'd rather keep things safer than trying to push the envelope with things like open meetings, act requirements, and restrictions, and uh, perhaps some separation of powers issues. But uh, I will, of course, always leave some of the decision making on how to proceed or how to approach things to the clients, you know, whether it's as individuals or as the bodies. So, um, I take that direction seriously. Anyways, um, let's see. I think that one of the main uh, goals that we have here is um, advising on the dice at some meetings in parliamentary law. And then there is a lot of questions that I get from some individual members with leadership on parliamentary law. And that's the rules of procedure, right? Chapter 230. Robert's Rules for Order. So I've always got Robert's Rules 12th edition with me. I have an infolio views here, so I can look things up quickly, copy and paste here. And so when a member that has a question about how this body a function now rules procedure, it goes to them. I think one thing I wanted to mention today for sure was um, what might be a sense of frustration in not giving definitive answers sometimes on some of those parliamentary law questions. And uh, one reason for that is the nature of it. Um, parliamentary law is generally involves questions that are not justiciable by a court. And that means that uh, it's more of a political question, policy question for the parliamentary body to decide. They're the final writers of parliamentary law, it's the parliamentary body, which is 
wir die sehen, wie wo, how you can show them the five Robert's rules. Uh, of course, uh, if some of those was out of the pile rules aren't followed, it doesn't mean, and the same way decide to stop with it, it doesn't necessarily mean that now that's the end of it. Someone can bring it to process, claim that well, you didn't apply your own rules of procedure to do something, and spend to apply all those rules in chapter two thirty Robert's rules. But I mention it because it doesn't always mean that uh, that's it, the end of it. If a body doesn't apply its own rules of procedure, um, that does give some traction to due process claim. If somebody wants to overturn the decision, that affected them. And this generally isn't um, the policy decisions you make, of course. It's the ones that have some substantive effect. Uh, let's see. I, uh, like I said, was just going to take about five minutes here and hang over, over our agenda. Yeah, of course. Dean, you, you mentioned that uh, there was an exception to three meeting, uh, three members in a communication if they're sponsors of an item. Could you clarify what you mean there? Because that's news to me. Um, give me a minute for clarity and teams to show up. <laughs> um, Uh, the exception is when you uh, give direction in a meeting, it's an open meeting. So um, if, for example, here today we all decided to sponsor an ordinance, uh, mm. because you gave direction here at the open meeting, I could have more than three members be sponsored for it. Uh, you know, we're here in a recorded open meeting. Um, that's really what the Open Meetings Act requires for the body to consider and deliberate it needs to be an open meeting. For doing that here on the record, uh, I could take um, more than three members to sponsor an ordinance. The problem though is an interim between this meeting and uh, I guess the next open meeting where it's considered, we can't have that deliberation, we can't have any deliberation with more than uh, the full number of sponsors. So we still don't usually go that way. So it's not an exception. It's, be safer. it's not an exception then. Okay, thank you. You can have multiple members sponsored, but you still can't have multiple four or more okay. deliberating on the back end. Mm -hmm. That's, thank you. Anyone else? I don't see anyone. Thank you, Dean. I didn't catch that last part. <laughs> For my part, yeah. I, mean, I was going to mention one last piece is that having your council, but you also have the Department of Law, they have subject matter experts, and um, I think we're all aware of that through some specialized areas where uh, engaging their assistance is very helpful. And of course, there's apprehension about doing that, depending on the sensitivity of the matter and the administration's position. You know, uh, anyways, nothing that you're not that familiar with, I think. Well, thanks for having me speak for a few minutes today. But I'll let you get back to some more the matters. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. So it's 11.10, and uh, we have an entire conversation that hasn't happened, and we have 20 <laughs> minutes until our guests arrive. And so is this a conversation that can happen in 20 minutes, or is it something that we should belay? Yeah, it can't be done. And so probably what we do right now is take that break, and then get ourselves set up. No, and, and before we do that, actually, I just wanted to ask if, if Jamie um, had any comments or, or anything you wanted to share since um, you're here from elections. Thanks. So Barbara has always encouraged me to uh, develop relationships with the assembly. So that was my intent of being here today. <laughs> we are doing really intriguing things in elections right now, like talking about how to build databases and, and stuff, which isn't nearly as intriguing as communications. Um, but that was my intent for being here, was just to get some FaceTime. And uh, I think the clerk's office is developing a plan to 
to rotate Desiree and I into clerking. So oh, wow. we'll be seeing more of you. Mm. Cool. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jamie. I agree, um, Chris, that probably um, we should just go ahead and take a break yeah. and then prepare for our next um, item, the panel. Okay. Great. Thanks, everybody. All right. The recording will be paused as we go on break, and we'll pick up at 1130 when the next session starts. Yeah.